Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul McCarthy, IRI's Europe Director, and I would like to thank you for joining us for this timely discussion. Uh, Kosovo's election, a political earthquake. The International Republican Institute is pleased to co-host this morning's event with the Atlantic Council. First of all, I'd like to uh, cover some housekeeping issues. <clears throat> This event is being live streamed on Facebook Live, but we will not be taking any questions from Facebook. Those wishing to submit a question may do so by sending a message within the Q&A window. On the bottom of your screen, you will see the option to open the Q&A box where you will be able to type and send your question. Questions are now open. On February 14th, Kosovo held SNAP parliamentary elections, which were won in a landslide by the Movement for Self-Determination, or LVV, of former Prime Minister Albin Kurti. Albania's traditional governing parties, the Democratic Party of Kosovo, PDK, and the Democratic League of Kosovo, LDK, saw their support decline precipitously. Based on their electoral victory, LVV may be able to govern alone without these two parties, both of which may find themselves outside government for the first time. What does this apparent political earthquake mean for Kosovo's future, for its young democracy, its path towards the EU, and efforts by Washington and Brussels to answer, uh, to normalize relations between Pristina and Belgrade? To help us answer these questions, we are delighted to have with us three experts with long experience with Kosovo, the Western Balkans and transatlantic efforts to resolve the region's most intractable problems. Ambassador Daniel Fried has served as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs and as United States Ambassador to Poland. Ambassador Fried retired from the State Department in 2017 after 40 years of service and is now the Wiser Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Albert Krasnici is Program Director at Democracy Plus, a leading organization in Pristina promoting election analysis and integrity. IRI has had the pleasure to work with Democracy Plus on the expansion of its impressive online elections data platform, which maps and analyzes election results in Kosovo going back to 2010. And finally, Marta Onorato is IRI's resident program director in Kosovo, where she directs the Institute's efforts in the country. Marta came to IRI after a decade long career in the OSCE, where she led important democratization efforts in Kosovo and in Albania. I am going to now turn to Ambassador Fried to provide some opening remarks. Ambassador Fried, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Paul. You described me as an expert, but not really, not for a while. My experience in Kosovo was intense 2006, 2007, 2008, where I was working with Frank Wisner on the issues of Kosovo independence. And we made that decision and carried it out. And it was the right decision. But it wasn't easy because it came over the objections of Serbia and of Serbia's friends, and there was not unanimity in the European Union. There were a number of governments which then and now refused to support the vast majority of Europeans and did not recognize Kosovo's independence. The move to independence was necessary because the status quo of a not terribly well ad UN administration over, you know, over Kosovo was not tenable. And as we saw it at the time, there was a risk that this would be seen by Kosovars as a long, frustrating occupation, blocking them from their desired outcome. So we pushed for independence and we achieved it. Since then, the 
Europeans have tried and Americans have fitfully tried to sponsor various forms to resolve the standoff between Belgrade and Pristina. And it's not worked terribly well. There has been neither breakthrough progress, there has been considerable incremental progress on technical issues, but I don't see a breakthrough coming. I could be wrong. What is the opportunity now for Mr. Croce's smashing electoral victory? Well, I want to hear from Albert Krasnici, but it seems as an outsider that this was the Kosovars saying that they wanted a better life for themselves and an end to what they saw as a corrupt system which has sprung up since independence. And it's not the first such electoral change in Central and Eastern Europe or the Balkans. There have been many such, many such social revolts expressed in a democratic form against what people saw as corruption and then a new opportunity for new leadership. And this is the earthquake that counts. If Kosovo's path to the EU and path to recognition is still fraught, and I think it is, because the European Union is not in an expansive mood, then Kosovo's new leadership needs to do what it can do and what Mr. Kurti seemed to be saying he wanted to do during the election campaign, which is an end to corruption and a better life for Kosovo's, Kosovars, to build the country from within and thereby increase its chances of a better regional and European future, which is, I think, the right choice. So in this election, I see opportunity. Kosovo's political capital, with Brussels and Berlin and its ability to thwart the objectives of its enemies, which want to see Kosovo as a failed corrupt state. I'm sure that's what Putin wants or, or nationalists in Belgrade. Mr. Kurti has an opportunity to take the country, his country in a better direction and to build that capital at home by making Kosovo a success and realizing the potential of its independence. Now, I say this hoping to learn much from this session. I spent a lot of time in Kosovo then. And when the pandemic ends, I'd like to go back and see what's happened. But I see opportunity for Kosovo and therefore thereby for the region instead of the trap of endless negotiations or EU indecisiveness, Kosovo's leaders can do what it is in their power to do, which is make their country work at home and proceed from there. So thanks for the opportunity and I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fried, for those uh, remarks. And we look forward to uh, digging into the issues that you've raised. Uh, deeper in the um, in the question and answer. I'm going to now turn to uh, Albert Krasnici from Democracy Plus. Albert, can you give us your opening remarks, please? Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Martha, for this uh, opportunity. Dear Ambassador Fried, distinguished uh, participants, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share my reflections about uh, Kosovo's elections. This event is rightly called the political earthquake as our political scheme was entirely transformed within a very short period of time. LVV reached the most impressive results in the history of elections in Kosovo, nearly 50% of the total votes cost, while the other traditional parties who have been in power for the last two decades, PDK and LDK, got the lowest results since the beginning of the political pluralism in Kosovo. Political stability in Kosovo is much needed in order to move forward with all the necessary reforms. Until now, no government has achieved to complete its full term of five years. Only last year, we had the three different prime ministers. The year started with the caretaker Haradinaj government, continued with short-lived Kurtis government, 
and concluded with unconstitutionally elected Houthis government. As a result, the frequent change of government left little space for meaningful political progress. As much as the country needs strong government and political stability, it also needs an active opposition to oversee the government. Currently, the political parties, which most likely will remain in opposition, are unconsolidated. The chairman of LDK has resigned due to electoral results, and PDK is still with acting chairman since the resignation of Kadri Vesely, who is facing indictment at the special court. The recovery of the opposition from the electoral results does not look like to happen anytime soon. They could take a bigger hit if the likely scenario of new election as a result of a failure to elect a new president take place soon. This is a good momentum for all political parties to cooperate for the elections, for the election of the new president who should represent the will of the people and not the interest of a certain political party. For LVV to form the government and start the new era, both in terms of reforms and anti-corruption efforts, and for the opposition parties to recover from their loss in election and restructure themselves. These uh, elections were not only a political earthquake, but also a cultural earthquake. This change has been made possible due, due to the, uh, by the willingness of the women and the youth who traditionally have voted as their household heads, but not this time. Based on the age groups, LVV had the greatest support among youth people between uh, the ages of 18 and 24. On the other hand, the LDK and the uh, LDK uh, had the greatest support among those over the age of 55. Another difference worth noting between party voters uh, was that based on the gender, according to the latest exit polls, 60% of the women surveyed voted for the LVV compared to the 35% of the men. VV had more women in, of, in its list of candidates, as well as the largest uh, number of women and men uh, on the list of VV uh, are between the age 31 to 40 years old. Uh, also, uh, uh, one of the main uh, promises during the electoral campaign of VV was to alleviate unemployment and fight corruption. These two are the, uh, also the main concerns of citizens, according to many public opinion polls. Expectations are high uh, for Kurti governments to fight corruption and also to elevate unemployment. Uh, even though the elections day went quite well, uh, the announcement of the preliminary results in the evening showed dark sides in terms of minority representation in the assembly. It is suspected that Serbian list has formed satellite political parties of Bosniaks and Roma in order to increase its influence in the assembly. This is an important task for local authorities to prove commitment for protections of effective minority representation, since if society turns a blind eye to this phenomenon, it could be abused on larger scales in future elections. Thank you very much. I'm open for any questions to further discussion. Thank you very much, Albert, for that comprehensive uh, overview um, of the situation post-election in Kosovo. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Marta Onorato uh, to share her thoughts. Marta? Thank you, Paul. Uh, dear participants, as the title of this conference clearly summarizes, the shock that this election caused in the political class has been huge. Its consequences can be seen, uh, first of all, on the political parties. If you look at the preliminary results and we compare them with the ones of the past elections over the last 20 years, it seems that 2021 marks a break of periods. After a 21-26 phase dominated by the Democratic League of Kosovo and the 2007-2019 one dominated by the parties created by the war commanders, is it legitimate to think that we have just entered the period of the self-determination movement? Sure, it is early to answer. 
LVV with an electoral campaign focused, uh, as it was said, on anti-corruption, justice and employment, achieved in 2021 its best result ever, without about, uh, with about 48% of the votes, when the final result has not uh, come out yet. However, if you look at the result of LVV over the years, it is clear that we are dealing with a constant increase, probably due to its focus on social economic issues and the fact that it has never had, except for a short period last year, government responsibilities. In alliance with Vios Osmani, who had run in 2019 with LDK, LVV has increased so far its previous result by 21.58%. Can Mrs. Mani's alignment in the LVV list have contributed to such a result? If we then look at the voter turnout, 47.06%, the highest of the last 14 years, different questions can be raised on the role played in LVV's victory, also by those who did not normally vote and by the high mobilization of the Kosovo diaspora. A similar reasoning can be applied to understand the lowest result ever obtained by LDK, which passed from 24.55% in 2019 to 13.08% in less than two years. Created by Brain Rugova, the oldest Kosovo party has had its ups and downs in the post-2001 Kosovo elections and has been both an opposition and a ruling party. It has a reach at the national level and has cooperated over the years with all major political parties in Kosovo. But in the last election, LDK, with uh, a Euro-Atlantic approach and open to continue the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, has suffered a drastic drop. Can the departure of Vios Osmani and her supporters have uh, influenced this result in the same way that it has increased the support to LVV? Can its result be influenced by a public campaign placing uh, uh, it among the old regime parties? Was the LDK electoral campaign sufficiently responsive to citizens' needs and priorities? The many post-election interviews released by LDK members clearly convey the need for a renewal of its leadership and in general for a reform indispensable to face the incoming challenges. The recent resignation of the LDK leader, Issa Mustafa, seems also to go in this direction. As for the parties emerged immediately after the Kosovo conflict, mainly PDK and AAK, we can see that they also follow a descending trend. Although their drop has not been as drastic as that of LDK, we can say that these elections have identified also for them the need for reform and highlighted that the merits of the world alone will increasingly be insufficient. These parties have a strong regional basis and their electorate does not seem to have changed much. The departure of its leaders may have helped to compact their ranks, but it seems clear that for the time to come, these parties will have a double challenge playing their opposition role and conducting an internal reform, trying to expand the scope of their electorate beyond the traditional, their traditional areas. To conclude, the February 14 elections seem to have brought a new configuration of Kosovo's political class and several challenges are approaching. The stability of a government without alliance, the, establish the establishment of strong uh, institutions, uh, the election of the president, the dialogue with Serbia, the reform of the losing parties, the strengthening of a constructive opposition. A wise saying goes that not all evil comes to harm. And I think it makes sense today when from a great loss, there is more chance to gain than from a victory. Maybe this is the case for LDK and other parties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta, and to our other uh, panelists as well for the uh, excellent um, overview remarks um, on these important elections uh, moving forward. Um, I'll, I'll take uh, the privilege of the moderator's position to 
ask a first question, but uh, before I do that, I want to remind the audience, uh, please uh, send your questions uh, to the Q&A function in, uh, in the webinar here, uh, and uh, we'll get those moving. So um, please think about your questions. Uh, my question, first of all, is uh, to Ambassador Freed. Uh, given the elect uh, electoral results and your long experience uh, uh, working in the region, but also on European and transatlantic affairs, could you comment a little bit about whether uh, Kurti and LVV's victory in Kosovo, does this make the job of transatlantic cooperation on the Western Balkans more difficult, less difficult, and why? I'd like to start out with the easy questions first. The opportunity that Kurti has is to actually do what he was elected to do. And I think that both Albert Krasnici and Marta Honorato gave Excellent analysis. He was elected to, to fix the corruption and give people a better life. And it was a victory for a new kind of po and, and less corrupt politics. He needs to act while his political mandate is at his strongest. It will only go down. And he needs, he needs to push to do what he was elected to do and not focus on what the EU is going to do to reward him or what the US is going to do or how to position himself vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, whatever it is that, that Belgrade wants or is planning, which is why I emphasize the need for him to do what he can. I mean, self-determination means exactly that, right? Now, having said that, to answer your question, look, the Biden administration is going to be able to work with Europe on everything better. Um, the Trump administration had this, uh, this strange initiative on Serbia-Kosovo, which produced a lot of show and not a lot of substance, and it infuriated the Europeans. Um, I don't know what they were doing, and I don't know what Rick Grinnell was doing, pushing for the, the, the pushing the Kosovars. That's over. I think that the, the new team, uh, the new foreign policy team of the Biden administration understands the Balkans. The president knows where they are. He knows the issues. Tony Blinken does. Um, Amanda Sloat, the senior director for, at, the, at the National Security Council staff, is actually knows a lot about Southeast Europe. So you're going to have a, a team in Washington that is pro-European and knowledgeable about things on the ground, which is great. But there's not going to be a breakthrough. I'm going to be blunt here. There's not going to be a breakthrough on issues external to Kosovo, not with Serbia, not with, not with the Serbs facing parliamentary elections and Brussels has a lot of issues on its mind right now. That's not where I would throw my political weight. Now, again, Albert Kasnici is right there. He's in Pristina. So I will defer. If he thinks I'm wrong, I'm going to listen hard. But my sense is that the new government, that, that Marta was right about the agenda. It's the opposition organizing itself to be constructive. It's the election of the president. It's a competent government. It's relations with um, you know, the IMF and a practical agenda. That's key. And then tell the EU what it is that, how, how they can help, what Kurti needs to make a success. And I think they may be they may be willing to listen, also out of relief that they're no longer fighting with Washington about the Western Balkans. Thank you, Ambassador um, Albert. Would you like to comment uh, on the question and what Ambassador Fried has said? Uh, maybe I'm just uh, if I may connect to uh, questions uh, I got to the the chat. It's uh, about the attempts. If, 
If uh, before we go to that, is there anything you, extra you want to say on uh, the question I posed and what Ambassador Freed uh, said, and then we'll move to the questions. Okay, um, I'm fully agreed with uh, Ambassador Freed. So expectations are very high from Kurti to form the government initially because he had, uh, if I may call, the failed um, attempt last year to form and uh, to have a sustainable government with his partner LDK. And now uh, there is a, also Kurti has a 58 percent, eight uh, MPs in the parliament, but he still needs uh, coalition partners uh, to form a new government. And even uh, what is more important to elect the president because it needs two thirds of the votes of the parliament to elect the president from the assembly. And if they fail, we need uh, also to, to have um, other extraordinary snap elections. So it's uh, gonna be a key momentum also to have uh, cooperation with other political parties, which Kurti till now hasn't demonstrated while he was in the opposition. He wasn't very constructive in a sense of cooperating with other political parties. So now we will see how the other parties uh, are going to cooperate with the new Kurti government. People are expect, uh, in fact, expectations are very high and even beyond the practical uh, possibilities because people are expecting that the new government will create a new jobs and everyone will uh, get uh, employed and they will fight the corruption. And uh, uh, so it's gonna be a much harder process which needs an involvement from all the other actors and no leader alone can, can do it. So uh, I'm hoping for the people to be more realistic and uh, not to be uh, disappointed by the actions of the new, new government. Thank you, Albert. Uh, we're going to move to questions and answers uh, from the audience and there's, they're starting to come in now and I'd encourage all of our participants to send your questions in in the Q&A function. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a question to Albert. Uh, were there any attempts uh, of uh, external interference in Kosovo's elections, successful or unsuccessful? And here I think we're talking about our uh, foreign authoritarian uh, friends uh, meddling in the elections. Uh, Albert? Yeah, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, well, there is no any proven uh, data about the direct uh, interference in the electoral results, as we have seen in the previous presidential election in the US. But there is an uh, interference in sense of uh, controlling the vote of the Serbian communities. Vista Srpska, or, or Serbian list, is a, a political party established in 2013 as a result of the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia in Brussels for the normalization of the relations. And now uh, they are the only Serbian political parties represented in the parliament because all the other alternatives of Serbian alternatives uh, didn't achieve to get any seats in the parliament. In the previous elections, according to all the observation missions internationally and domestic ones, they have proven that there was an intimidation for local Serbs to vote for other parties except the Serbian list. And just last night, we have seen a brutally uh, attacked a son of a Serbian progressive uh, leader, uh, Nena Drasic, who was beaten from his classmates, 30 of them in a group attack, uh, because uh, his father is uh, cooperating with other Albanian political parties uh, in a sense to improve the lives of his uh, citizens. So th there are attempts to, uh, uh, to not allow Serbian uh, community who lives in Kosovo to cooperate and to integrate fully in uh, Kosovo institutions. Thank you very much, Albert. Uh, do, do any of the other panelists want to speak to the issue of uh, foreign influence in the elections? Okay, we're going to uh, then move on. I actually want to uh, pose another question. And again, I'll remind the audience if they have 
questions, do send them in. Um, I had a question about the LDK, uh, the Democratic lead of, League of Kosovo, the oldest uh, democratic political party. It did not do so well in these elections. And I wanted to ask Marta Onorato what she thought about the future. What, what is LDK's future? Um, just a couple of months ago, they had the prime minister's uh, position. They've been in uh, governments uh, throughout the uh, 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 post-war history of Kosovo, also its independence as well. And now it looks like they're gonna be out of government for the first time. So what, what do you think is going to become of LDK, Marta? First of all, I think that uh, as I've already mentioned in my presentation, uh, they need to reflect on the reasons uh, of the, this uh, uh, result. And uh, they have already started to do that. Uh, the first action is a renovation, uh, needed is a renovation of the leadership. And they have uh, started, they have uh, uh, Issa Mustafa has resigned uh, the day after uh, the election. Uh, they have started to call uh, the council and they have started probably to involve more uh, their uh, constituencies to, and the members of the party to decide on which direct, direction to, to take. For sure, what is needed is uh, to learn from what happened. And it means that, uh, as I said, uh, one of the reason of the big loss uh, might be the fact that their young uh, member, uh, Ms. Viasa's money, left. And uh, probably what they should uh, try to do is uh, to give uh, more space to youth and women within uh, their own party. Uh, this is a long process. They have started with a uh, change in the leadership, and I hope that uh, a deep uh, reflection will be done. As far as I know, uh, they will be electing a new uh, chairperson of the uh, president of the um, uh, party only for a two year time, and then we will have again a new election. This time, I think is needed in these two years to go deeply into a full renovation of uh, the party. Thank you, Marta. Uh, Albert, did you have any thoughts about the future of the LDK that you'd like to share? Yeah, LDK is quite in an uncomfortable position right now because uh, there is a need for a change in their leadership and also to reinvent themselves. Till now, they have been quite uh, active in promoting the values of their founder, Mr. Ibrahim Rugova, our uh, historic president. But for the youth, uh, it does not say too much to them because they need a real uh, uh, alternatives to, uh, for the, the, the government and not uh, to the symbolic uh, things. So LDK uh, now has a very important uh, 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 decision which they are going uh, to, to make and it will depend who will be his uh, their new leader so if they are going to have uh, someone who will be more energetic with a different vision and more uh, to approach better to the citizens especially to the women and to the youth they may have a chance to recover and also to compete for uh, uh, higher position, uh, but uh, they are seeing uh, quite difficult now because they are having internal uh, issues and uh, they risk also to separate again into two political uh, parties. They already lost uh, a lot by Vyosa uh, Osmani, who was uh, in their party and now uh, they need so uh, real uh, choices and to be genuine, not something to improvise just for the sake of electing the new new president, but uh, to have a real uh, leader who can lead them uh, in in uh, next elections. Thank you very much, uh, Albert, for that response. Um, we have another question that I'll pose uh, to all the panelists, uh, whoever wants to respond to this. 
Um, Alban Corti uh, has been described in the past as a nationalist, as a left nationalist. Um, and also he has recently made some statements that he would be supportive of a federation and sometimes a unification of uh, Kosovo and Albania. Um, how, how fair are these assessments of him calling him a left nationalist? And also, uh, do you think that the, some sort of federation or coming together of Albania and Kosovo is now on the table? And what would that mean for the entire region? Uh, put this out to all the panelists. Please let me know if you'd like to answer. Ambassador? I will defer <clears throat> to Albert Krasnici about views in Kosovo about Albania and about some kind of federation or reunification. But it is ob but that kind of a step and talk like that is obviously fraught because of the precedent it sets. The Albanians were not interested in this the last time I checked with them. Now, granted, that's a while ago, but it may be just talk. And Kosovars and Albanians have different experiences. Their experience before 1991 was radically different. Their experience afterwards has also been different. Um, the, I'm not sure that Corti would love being a provincial leader instead of a national leader because I'll be in any, you know, in any plan like this, it's not going to be a federation of equals. Albania is the Lord, you know, that's the entity. But I don't know, I don't necessarily take this seriously. I understand, and in Kurti's position, I might want to develop some leverage of my own to get the Europeans to start responding to you know, the needs of Kosovars. But it is a fraught step, and I don't think that that kind of language will win him many friends in Berlin or Brussels where he needs them. And, and we can also talk about the fraught relationship between Albanian President uh, Eddie Rama and uh, Albin Corti. Uh, from what I hear, it's not necessarily a close uh, relationship. Uh, this is what we see from the outside. Uh, Albert, um, I'll turn to you to respond and then to Marta as well on this question. Yeah. But the statements uh, for the unification with Albania were made by Kurti and Adendosia while they were in the opposition. And they found it more as something to distinguish uh, themselves from the other uh, political party already established and who were in power. Now that Kurt is uh, much closer to the power, he is less and less mentioning the unification with Albania. Um, this looks uh, more like uh, a threat uh, to the EU and other uh, institutions, mostly new, who did, who did not deliver their promises for visa liberalization. Also, we have seen such kind of threats by uh, Mr. Tashi in the past for not delivering the visa liberalization to the people of Kosovo, who are the only ones without visa liberalization in the Balkans. So I'm not, not seeing something that uh, the internationals uh, should be worried about uh, any uh, declaration for unification with Albania. This is also forbidden by our constitution. And uh, this is the guarantee which we have made uh, for when we have declared our independence. Also, it needs, uh, it also the unification with other countries cannot uh, be done also by referendums. So it needs only the change of constitutions, 
which will we need also two thirds of the votes by other ethnic communities in, in represented in the parliament. Thank you, Albert. I'll turn to Marta and also, you know, what, what's the view from Kosovo? How popular is this idea? of uh, federation or unification of Albania and Kosovo? Well, I, I think that uh, the two panelists uh, have already said uh, most of the important points uh, about uh, Ms. Mr. Kurti's statement. I don't think that uh, the his statement was even the last days repeating uh, several times, I don't think it's to be taken uh, seriously. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was uh, the same statement made also by Mr. Aradinai, and uh, well, they are more uh, of a uh, well, nationalistic nature, maybe just to touch the spirit uh, of the people. At the end of the day, in the, the practical uh, terms, I agree with Ambassador Fritz. I think that uh, Kosovo, and I think that this is the feeling that is here. They uh, are proud of the their origin, the um, Kosovo Albanian, I mean, but uh, uh, they are also proud of being uh, from Kosovo. And I think that uh, uh, being part of a federation, uh, not in any, maybe in an equal, fully equal uh, status, uh, uh, would be not easily accepted. They have fought to get their independence, and I think that they are proud about it. I don't think that they are going to, uh, not only for legal reasons that were mentioned by uh, Albert, but uh, also for the spirit, I don't think they are going to uh, look for a unification with uh, Albania. Okay, thank you, Marta. Um, we're gonna move uh, to another question, and um, this was touched upon in the presentations. Does the alleged transfer of Serbian list votes uh, to Bosniak and Roma candidates risk unpicking the accepted constitutional settlement of 20 guaranteed seats for non-majority communities? And if so, what safeguard should there be in future to ensure that the 70, excuse me, the seven non-majority communities uh, each have their own legitimate representatives. Marta or Albert, would you like to answer that? Uh, that... It's a difficult question. Uh, the, maybe Albert can uh, provide a more detailed answer. What can I say is only that probably this uh, scenario that is uh, been uh, denounced during these days was not uh, fully foreseen by Mr. Atisari. Then I think that there is a problem. The vote is free uh, and, uh, well, it might be uh, behind the vote a manipulation. These are only uh, speculations but it's difficult uh, when there are 10 guaranteed seats, when there is a party uh, composed by uh, and uh, led by uh, Bosnian uh, minority representative, well, it's difficult to say and to, uh, to say that, uh, uh, this specific person I'm talking about, uh, Miss Adriana Olsic, is not uh, uh, allowed to represent uh, the Bosnian minority. Then I think that uh, uh, either because uh, uh, the same, uh, uh, according to the question, the same situation could happen also if uh, there were not 10 uh, reserve seats for all the non-Serbian minorities, but if there was one for each uh, of the non-Serbian minority. Even in this situation, um, uh, a similar scenario like the one that we are experiencing during these uh, elections 
could uh, have happened. And I think that is very difficult to provide a concrete solution with this constitutional framework. I don't know, it's uh, maybe Albert has more uh, uh, innovative ideas about it. Albert, and before we turn to Albert, I just want to remind the audience, please send your questions in uh, to the uh, Q&A. The Q&A is open. Um, Albert, we'll turn to you now on this question, or actually questions, because the first question um, uh, has to do with the actual event and how worried we need to be about it. And then the second is what safeguards should be put, could be put into place. Um, to uh, ensure that the seven non-majority communities each have their own legitimate uh, representatives. Albert? Mm. It seems that we in the Balkans are very creative for evil to find the ways to disobey the, the rules. Uh, Atisari couldn't even think that we can uh, misuse the system and to extend the influence over the vote of non-majority uh, non communities. Uh, for the very first time, we have seen that political parties from Serbia, communities also from the other Albanian community, have uh, established political parties from non-majority communities to serve as a satellite political parties in order to influence them uh, when they got elected in the parliament. Uh, what this is uh, now very hard for those uh, real genuine uh, political parties who represent the needs of their communities to prove for uh, this uh, thing that has happened. Uh, but this is more uh, something which a state prosecutor should uh, be focused on and to find evidences to prove their, uh, their claims. So also, also in the future, uh, I'm expected from them to be more uh, active in overseeing the elections. And also by, there is a need also for uh, international observers to be focused on those uh, uh, Serbian majority communities, because this time, this time uh, in those elections, also due to uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, there weren't any uh, uh, international observation missions here in Kosovo. Also, for the very first time, OSC wasn't involved in helping or assisting CEC, Central Election Commission, in organizing the elections in those municipalities. And uh, we are seeing that in those municipalities, 80, the turnout is 85%, which is almost double compared to the previous elections and also compared to the trends in other uh, municipalities uh, in, in, in Kosovo. So I'm seeing that uh, this is a real test for local authorities uh, to prove that uh, we should uh, protect uh, rights uh, and interests and the representations uh, of the rights of uh, non-majority uh, communities to be represented in the parliament. Otherwise, it's going to be a huge window uh, for the future, also by other political parties, uh, big ones, to uh, influence over those uh, uh, mandates. Uh, we had a, a provocative comment, I would label it, um, uh, from the audience, uh, but I think it's interesting. Um, what if, uh, what would happen if Veta Vendosia organized uh, yeah, thousands of Albanians, let's say 2,000 Albanians, to vote for Nenad uh, Rashid's list, who's the opposition figure among Serbs in Kosovo. Would this be uh, more problematic than the possibility of around 6,000 votes uh, from Srpska Lista directed at Adriana Ho uh, Hojic? So provocative. Is this a possibility where Albanian parties could direct? And have they done that in the past? That would be interesting for me to know as well. Um, if, either Albert or... or, uh, or, or if I, no, if I, I just want to say that uh, I somehow agree with this uh, provocative question. It was what I was trying to say. Uh, I mean, uh, although we need to have representatives for the minorities, there is no legal impediment for anybody to vote for them. 
then if I understand that uh, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, an Albanian in Bosnia is not obliged to vote for his uh, own official uh, party, then I see that uh, it's uh, a little complicated even for the prosecutor office to say that this is a breach of the uh, electoral code. And I think that uh, uh, the situation would be practically the same, the one described by Jeff in the in, uh, in his questions, uh, by uh, and the one that is happening uh, during these days. Then I think that he is problematic in the sense that he is uh, breaching in somehow the spirit of the reserve seat, but legally speaking. Uh, I'm not sure if something can be really done. Albert, did you have a comment on that? Uh, yes, um, but this is something that easily can, can happen to mobilize uh, um, some voters to vote for uh, certain political parties who represent uh, Serbian uh, communities and to gain from the guaranteed seats who are uh, dedicated for, for them. So this is why we uh, need to intervene right now and not leave uh, that this phenomenon to be a practice for, for future elections. Otherwise, uh, we are going to put uh, to endanger the entire idea of having guaranteed seats for the representation of, of uh, non-majority communities. Uh, for certain party to do this is a bit uh, more uh, more hard and more danger because as I mentioned in my, my uh, opening remarks, just yesterday we have seen uh, 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 very uh, brutally attack on a son of uh, Nena Drashic because they think that he is cooperating with, with Albanians. Um, and this was a terrible act and uh, state institutions should act uh, forcefully in not uh, seeing this uh, same scenario in, in the future. So they can be persecuted or even worse, we have seen also the assassination of uh, Oliver Ivanovic, another uh, Serbian figure politician who was uh, assassinated in the northern part of Serbia because he had different views uh, from those uh, who controls the, the Serbs in, in, in those, those parts. So uh, it, it, it's going to be more, more danger for, for them to try this uh, scenario. Thank you, Albert. I um, had a question for Ambassador Freed. You know, given your experience working uh, with the EU, within the EU, um, and on transatlantic relations, if you had a guess, and obviously um, we have no way of knowing specifically, but given how they've approached Kosovo in the past, this is Brussels. What do you think Brussels is thinking right now? And I'm thinking, you know, the Brussels as opposed to the national capitals at this point. What do you think they're thinking now, given that Albin Kurti um, has won? Do they think this is a good development, a bad development? Um, how, how do you think it's going to affect how they view uh, uh, EU accession, which admittedly is, as you've pointed out yourself, uh, is a process uh, fraught with problems uh, moving forward? So what is Brussels thinking now? Well, some of them will remember Kurti a number of years ago and think of him as a rabble rouser and a troublemaker and a street politician. But the ones who know Kosovo better, I suspect will understand that this election was an expression of genuinely mass desire in Kosovo for change. And they will look at this with an as an opportunity, then immediately followed by their hope that Kurti and the new government actually can do what they say they want to do. The problem is the the Balkan specialists in the EU, both in the EU structures itself and in national capitals, really do want to do the right thing by Kosovo. But the senior, the, the politicians in Europe are just not going to be able to open Europe's doors to new members for some time. 
which is why I keep stressing the need for Kosovars to do what it is in their power to do, which is fix, build their own country and create the circumstances so when the moment is right for Europe to be more outward looking and bring in countries as they need to, as they should, that Kosovo will be ready. That is the experience of successful countries from 1989 on. Timing is everything, right? Um, the, the, the road to EU membership is not great right now, but that doesn't mean it's going to be bad for always. And Kurti didn't run, he didn't run in the elections on a platform of I'll bring us into, into the EU. He run on a, ran on a platform of I'm gonna fight corruption and make this a better place. Well, let him do it. And in doing so, he will strengthen his country's ability to make its case to Europe. And I think the Europeans will appreciate that. Great. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, just, uh, we are coming to the end of the time uh, here, our time here, and uh, have one more question uh, that I'd like to pose. I'll pose this to uh, Marta. Uh, what are the chances, in your opinion, that the election of the president will fail? You know, those are come, those are, uh, on the to-do list for the new parliament, um, uh, therefore trigger, triggering another uh, election? Well, uh, everything depends on the flexibility of uh, Vet Vendosi and Mr. Kurti. If he's going to be able to cooperate, to uh, find a dialogue with the other parties, then considering the preliminary results uh, and considering uh, the uh, impact the diaspora votes that have not been yet counted uh, might have on the number of seats that Elisabeth Vendosi will have uh, in parliament, then there is still a possibility that uh, the election uh, of the president will be success successful. But as I said, this depends on flexibility of Mr. Kurti, his capacity to cooperate and dialogue with other parties, and also uh, depends on the constructive approach uh, that the opposition parties will have. Uh, I think that uh, these are the three elements that can see this successful. Uh, election of the president. On the contrary, we go again to early election and as uh, Albert has underlined earlier, mm -hmm. well, this is for sure a very bad for the country, is very bad for Kosovo people and for sure doesn't help the advance, uh, advancing of uh, the countries in uh, his, uh, its reforms. And for sure it's difficult uh, for Kosovo to keep facing the uh, difficult economic uh, uh, situation created by the pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Marta. And uh, well, we've come to the end of a very interesting event on a very interesting uh, country that is going to have to uh, as Ambassador Freed has rightly pointed out, is going to have to focus on building itself up as uh, one of Europe's uh, youngest democracies uh, moving forward. And uh, we at IRI, as I'm sure um, uh, our colleagues at the Atlantic Council, we're going to be um, following very closely how things go in under the new leadership in Kosovo and uh, looking forward to more and more political stability, both within Kosovo and the region. Uh, so we wish uh, Kosovo and the new leadership the best moving forward. Uh, and uh, we're going to do what we can from where we sit in the International Republican Institute, as I know our colleagues at the Atlantic Council will also be working hard as well to see uh, that this is the best success possible. So I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank our panelists. 
Um, thank you very much for participating. Also wanted to thank the Atlantic Council for co-hosting this event with the International Republican Institute and also for all the participants uh, who took part today and especially those who posed very interesting questions. Thank you very much everyone for taking part today and we hope to see you soon um, at IRI and at the Atlantic Council. Thank you very much.